Revelation chapter 15. So chapters 15 and 16 kind of go together, you know, like where these chapter breaks went in was somewhat arbitrary when they put chapters in the Bible and okay. the verses are also somewhat arbitrary. So sometimes you'll go, why is that verse so long? And like, why is like half the sentence one verse and half the sentence another verse? And they didn't do it perfectly. Okay. But they, they can't really change it because it's standardized and you know, otherwise you have to print all new Bibles. So first chapter and verse number is a little arbitrary. Uh, but in this case, chapters 15 and 16 actually work together as a unit, as one unit. Uh, together they tell the story of the third sevenfold uh, vision. So we're going to, we'll probably spend a couple weeks on these, maybe three weeks on these two chapters, because there's a lot going on. Uh, so we'll start with 15. Then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, all nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. After this I looked, and the temple of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen with golden sashes across their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. Okay. Cheerful, as always. Cheerful. All right. So we had two earthly visions. The first two sevenfold vision, you know, the first one with the you know, the horsemen, the apocalypse and all that. So that was a human's eye view, right, of what was going on on earth. That was like a first person shooter. So you're there, you see, you saw, John saw these things happening as it was happening on earth. The second sevenfold vision, right, the trumpet angels. So that was a heaven's eye perspective of what was happening on earth, right? So we saw it from kind of like God's eye view of the earth and you saw everything that was happening in the earth and the sea and what have you. So now with this third sevenfold vision, uh, which is introduced by an angel with a sensor, which is the thing you, you put your, uh, or like a thurible is what you put your incense in, right? So the thing you swing the incense, yeah. it's called a thurible. Uh, a sensor, I think is technically the thing you put holy water in and you spritz with it, but I think they also call that... Uh, the thing with the fire, they call it a sensor. Um, so in this last one, we're going to see also events on Earth. And this time it is going to be uh, seven scenes introduced by the angel with the sensor. The first five scenes de depict events that take place concurrently. So they're taking place at the same time, kind of like in the first sevenfold vision, when we saw the four horsemen, we said, oh, well, you can actually think of all four of those horsemen like going at once, even though it's like, well, I saw one, and I saw another, and I saw another. Well, they actually are all active at the same time. We see that today. So you got four, you know, war, tyranny, pestilence, death, right? Okay. Famine, disease, all those things are happening simultaneously. Uh, so the same thing's going to happen here. You're going to see the first... Uh, the first five scenes in chapter 16, you'll see them that they, they take place concurrently. They all cover the same time period, which is the time period of the Great Tribulation, which is the same time period the second vision covered. It's the same uh, time period the first vision covered. It's from Christ's ascension to his second coming. Basically, all the time since Jesus left till he comes back, that's the Great Tribulation. Uh, the sixth scene, however, is going to show us the final battle, which is called Armageddon in Revelation, uh, which takes place just prior to the end of this world, right before Jesus comes back. And then the seventh 
vision. Uh, seventh scene envisions the end at the seventh coming, second coming of Christ. So we're going to see five scenes that show us what life is like, and then they're going to show us right before the end, and then the end. And so in verse 1, uh, John says, I, I, as he said, then I saw another portent in heaven, another sign in heaven. That's the third time John said a sign in heaven. The first time was in chapter 12, verse 1. The second time was in chapter 12, verse 3. And the third time is here. Uh, so the woman, the dragon, and now these seven angels. Uh, is there a significance to that? No. Not necessarily, but look at what, you know, if you have the, wo the woman clothed in the sun, the church, the devil, and now you have these angels. Uh, and it's described as great and amazing. So let's look real quick. Chapter 15, and I saw another Simeon sign in heaven that was, uh, yeah, mega, like we had that word in our sermon today, right? So like a seismos megas, great earthquake. So this is a mega, mega chi thoimais, that's a hard word to say. Thai, thor, au, thor, thou, thalmaston, thalmaston. So great and amazing. And thalmaston is that same root from the word we had a couple sermons ago, I don't remember what it was, but we talked about uh, amazing, uh, we got our word amazing from it. Same root word. Uh, so let's see. Sign in heaven uh, describes great and amazing. And so it's emphasizing that there is added significance here of what, what we're going to see. We should really pay attention to this one. Um, and it is a great and amazing sign because it's the final of the three sevenfold visions that show us what takes place between Christ leaving and Christ coming back. Uh, we've heard about the seven seals. We've heard about the seven trumpets. Now we're going to hear about the seven bowls. These are the bowl angels or the censer angels. A uh, bowl is easier to think of because um, you know, the bowls have the incense on it, and then they're going to throw it on the earth, and stuff's going to happen. So now we have the seven bowls of God's wrath. This final set of judgments is the most severe of the three sevenfold visions. Not again, not because time is progressing, and as time progresses things get worse, it is because John is writing, and every time John writes, he writes in a spiral. So the first sevenfold vision, here's the way the world is, and then it ends. And I'm going to tell you another vision, and the world ends, and it seems it's worse, more emphatic. Third sevenfold vision, yeah, it was bigger than the first one. Now this one's going to be bigger still. And he just does that. That's a, that's a hallmark of apocalyptic writing. So writing about end times is that they, they work in this spiral and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to make the emphasis to make more impact on the reader. Uh, so it's the same things happening we've seen happen, just more intensely, un until this one changes and then we actually do see the second coming in the last day. But we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Okay, so the final set of judgments is the most severe of the three sevenfold visions we've, we will see. Okay, we have seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So the specific task of these seven censor angels or seven bowl angels is the revelation, the revealing of the seven plagues, the seven last plagues, by which God will have vented and completed his fury. They're on a godly mission. They're working on behalf of God. I'm going to Sure. So on behalf of God and for the sake of his churches, they herald the last great effort of God to move the human race to repentance, to turn the human race to repentance before it's too late. Well, I've got my yep. buddies hanging around. Sure can. Yep, so the, the point of all of God's wrath has always been, because you know, he's not punishing you for your sin. Your punishment for your sin was taken care of by Christ on the cross. So when you think you're being punished by God or bad things are happening, you know, a couple reasons. You know, it's, it's, something, it's something to teach you to trust in him, something to teach you to turn to him in repentance, um, to teach you to rely on him more, basically. Find the light in the valley of darkness. 
Right. Right? So, it's the last great effort of God to move his children to repentance. You know, just like the God of old, God of the Old Testament, same, you know, same God, but it's the same triune God. Uh, but, you know, God was a lot more smitey back yeah. then. He was always throwing down wrath, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, making a point, wiping people off the face of the earth. You know, but the point that with uh, his children was always, it's like, hey guys, you know, I'm your God, you're my people. You know, I love you, love me, worship me only. Okay, God. And then they start whoring after other gods, and God's like, yeah, fine. These guys are going to conquer you. Oh, God, will rescue us. Okay. Now these guys are going to conquer you because you go right back to doing what you were doing. We don't learn. Yes, yeah, so we don't learn. They don't learn. We don't learn. So this is God's last ditch effort. It's like, okay, here you go. Are you going to repent? Are you going to Are you going to turn to me and believe? Are you going to what? What? Okay, so that's what this vision is all about. Is that last motivation, I guess, to repentance. Uh, the revelation of and sending out of the last plagues of God's fury are called a great and marvelous sign. So it's by these last plagues that God will display his righteous judgment and show forth the glory of his name. So it's like, yeah, here's, his, here's God's judgment. Oh, that's not fair. That's next week's sermon. Like, who are you to tell God what's fair, right? He's God. Everything he does is righteous and just. So he's showing forth his glory. He's like, look how righteous I am. If he just caved and said, oh, yeah, no, it's okay. Well, that diminishes his power and his glory. He can't not be God. Okay? All right. Verse 2. Controversial verse. A sea of glass mingled with fire. Hmm. This is a description of a battlefield. This is the battlefield on which the warfare between the church and the beasts of Satan take place. So the sea of glass symbolizes the peace and serenity which the church has even in the middle of the battle. Okay, so even in the middle of the battle, you have the sea of glass. Everything's smooth, everything's nice. Which we saw in the throne room of God in chapter 4, verse 6, the glassy sea-like crystal before the throne. Okay, so it is not a nuclear battlefield and they nuked it and the sand turned to glass. People try to turn it into that. It's like, oh yeah, it's fire and glass. That was a nuclear war. No, no, it's not. No. People in the first century didn't know what nuclear war was. They have to be able to understand this too. So if we put our 20 seconds, like, oh, it's something yeah. that's going to happen in the future. Well, that's not what apocalypse is either. It's telling you what's happening right now also. So this is the great tribulation. We're living in it. We've been living in it since Jesus left. We're going to keep living in it until he comes back. And this has to mean to them in the first century what it means to us. So no, it is not the aftermath of a nuclear war. Makes for cool movies. Makes for like really good post-apocalyptic dystopia horror movies and whatnot. But not what the Bible is actually telling us. Sorry. Okay, so the saints on earth are citizens of heaven. Even now, we are citizens of heaven. We're assured of the eternal peace and comfort, which belongs to all who enjoy that citizenship. That's what we can actually take from this sea of glass. It's like even on this battlefield, we have that calm, like what is before the throne of God in heaven, even here on earth. That's a reminder of our, our hope and assurance of faith that heaven is our destination for a while, and then we get the new earth upon which it's mingled with fire, which symbolizes the horrible suffering that they're enduring during the battle with Satan and all of his beasts. So yes, you're assured of, it's kind of like what we, we talk about every Sunday, really, is the sea of glass mixed with fire. So we have the peace and serenity of God that we know will be complete for us one day in eternity, but it's mixed with the fire of the trials and the temptations and everything else that we have to deal with here because we're still here. It's not heaven, but, uh, and so that's what that one simple verse is supposed to bring to our minds. Let's see, those that had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, those are those who remain faithful through the persecutions and suffering they experience on earth brought upon them by Satan and his earthly agents. Uh, 
which we saw that even back in chapter 13, verses 5 to 7, which said, The beast was given mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opens its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all the inhabitants of the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb. Okay, so, uh, yeah, if you remain faithful, yep, you have that assurance of that sea of glass before the throne, that peace and serenity in heaven, but you're still going to have the fire of trials like we talked about even today, right? The storm, you're still going to have storms. doesn't make the storms go away. It just helps make the storms more bearable. Okay, verses 3 to 4, uh, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Uh, those who remain faithful on earth are those who are brought to and kept in the faith by the Holy Spirit through God's holy word and sacraments. So God's word consists of two fundamental doctrines, which we talk about all the time because we're Lutheran. The law, which is symbolized by Moses, right? Even on next Sunday's transfiguration, you're going to see Moses and Elijah. What's Moses doing on the mountain? Because he represents the law. And Elijah's a dirt because he represents the prophets, the law and the prophets, which is the whole of basically the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. So we have these two fundamental doctrines, law symbolized by Moses and gospel, which is symbolized by Christ, by the Lamb. So the saints are those who are slain by the law and made alive by the gospel, uh, which is what one more time. You, okay. You, I'm sorry, I got drifted. A little bit. All right. So we have the law. We have we have every everything in Scripture is one of two things. It's law or gospel. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's like there are fundamental doctrine as Lutherans. Is everything has to do, there has to be law and there has to be gospel. You can't preach one without the other. You have to have both. And why? Because gospel doesn't do you any good if you don't understand you're a sinner. Well, the law takes care of that. Likewise, the law by itself doesn't do you any good because okay, you're a sinner. You're under a uh, sentence of condemnation by God. Great. There is no hope with that. You need the gospel. You need to hear that Christ died for you to take care of that. So these saints that are singing the song, uh, they sang the song of Moses, all these saints. Uh, They sat standing by the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds. Uh, If you look at Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 32, it is, it's, it's a song attributed to Moses called the Song of Moses that Moses prayed. Uh, you can read it. That, that's where the, what, what they're talking about. They sing the Song of Moses. That's actually Moses did, uh, which is an amalgamation of many teachings, uh, Jewish teachings from, from way back when. They put them all together and sang this song. So that's what they're quoting here, is the actual song of Moses that Moses sang. So again, that's Exodus uh, 15, Deuteronomy chapter 32. So these saints singing this song are those who are slain by the law and made alive by the gospel, because that's what the law does. The law always accuses, and it always kills, we would say because that's what happened to you in baptism. The law kills you. What is your sentence? Death. You're a sinner. You are condemned to die. Therefore, baptism, in your baptism, your old sinful nature is killed. And Christ makes you alive again. Unfortunately, we're still here, so that's a daily process. Every day, we die to sin and rise with Christ. And then every night we go to bed, we repent. We're forgiven. We get up in the morning. We do it again and again and again and again until mm-hmm. we die because that's what humans do. Because we are simultaneously this perfect saint Christ has made us and this wretched sinner. And he can't separate the two yet. Not yet. Will be one day, but not yet. Okay. So those are those two fundamental doctrines, this fundamental paradox of being a redeemed child of God is you're a sinner. You're also a saint at the same time kind of like how Jesus is true God and true man at the same time. Can't explain it. Can't take the two apart. Okay. 
So the law always kills, always accuses, always kills, but always shows you the need to repent. And the gospel shows you your Savior, who you can cling to, because how can I ever, how can I ever repay these sins under the sentence of death? Oh, yeah, Jesus died for that. So, right. So these saints are joining in that divine, heavenly liturgy that we talked about way back at the beginning of the book, where you saw them. Everybody's throwing their crowns on the ground and worshiping, and they sang a new song. You know, great, worthy is the Lamb to be praised. Right. Uh, the great Te Deum Ladamus, the great uh, to, uh, the, uh, the God we praise, to the God we praise. Same song. This song, all the little songs throughout this book, it's all part of the one big song that's being sung in the heavenly uh, tabernacle. Okay, and it, again, it echoes the song sung by the Israelites in Exodus 15 in response to God's delivering them from the tyranny of the Egyptians. So you always have that same language, that walking through water, right? The parting of the Red Sea, and the Israelites walked through that, but Pharaoh's army was drowned in it. Same thing with us. We made it through the water of baptism. Our old sinful nature didn't make it out. The old sinful nature is drowned and died, although he comes back every day. That's the paradox of, again. But we walked, went through the waters of baptism where our old sinful nature is killed, and we walk out alive. Uh, same with the uh, flood, right? The flood, Noah's flood. You know, eight people went in, eight people came out. They made it through the waters. Everybody else drowned, right? Okay, so it's all baptismal imagery, all baptismal language. So the words of the song glorify God as the Lord and judge of the nations in view of the fact that he alone is holy. As we sing in the glory in excelsis in our our liturgy, right? Glory to you. you know, we bless thee, we praise thee, we worship thee, we sanctify thee. Uh, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. You know, basically because you are, you alone are holy. You only are the Lord. Like you're only you're the only God. You're the only one that's holy. That's what we sing. So the faithful know there's only one true God, and all the nations will bow down to Him in the end. Or some it will be too late, but every at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. That's what's going to happen. Everybody's going to go, oh, there is a God. Yikes. <laughs> it's too late. Too late then. All right, so verses 5 to 8 then is talking about the sanctuary or the uh, tent, the sanctuary of the tent or tabernacle of witness in heaven. John's attention is now lifted heavenward where he sees the place where God's presence dwells, right? Because it's always been the image of where God dwells in the Bible. So in the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle, and they had the curtain, and the cloud of glory they followed during the day, and it was a pillar of fire by night. And then when, they, when it stopped, they put up the tabernacle, and that cloud of glory would go down into the most holy place and would dwell there. So God dwelled with his people. Uh, and you can see that in Exodus 25, uh, Exodus 40, all kinds of places. So the tabernacle of Moses, because God's the one that told Moses how to tell them to build it, so we call it the tabernacle of Moses, was the focal point of Israel's life with God. So now the heavenly tabernacle is the focus of new Israel, in scare quotes, new Israel, that's us, new Israel's life with God. God's holy presence is the center and the core of life, of the life of his saints in his heavenly glory. And it's in the divine service, again, where that heavenly presence descends, the heavenly tabernacle descends to earth, and God's children are privileged uh, to enter in and receive the divine gifts he offers us. So that's the Lord's Supper. Right, so with angels and archangels, going to keep repeating that until everybody goes, yeah, we know, Pastor, you know, heaven comes to earth. Yes. So that's why we could say that. We could sing with angels and archangels, because we are, because they're there, and we're there. And everybody who's on every altar everywhere is there of all times and places. That is a moment outside of time and space, even though it doesn't seem like it to us, because we're temporal creatures. But time and space end then at that moment when you have the Lord's Supper. Okay. 
And if that doesn't freak you out and wonder, like, okay, that's something really special going on then, isn't it? Yes, it is. That's why we take it so seriously. All right, so that's, that is where that song comes to earth, kind of. It's veiled. We don't see it clearly yet. Uh, we don't hear it yet. We will. All right, but he gives us those gifts to keep us in the faith, which is why it says, may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith, because that's why you just ate and drank it, to strengthen and preserve your faith until he comes again. Right? That's what his word and sacraments are for. And all this, all this vision we've been given before the seven angels even start. <laughs> okay? It hasn't even, that vision hasn't even begun. This is all prelude, as it were. Okay, and it, why, why is it given to us that way? Because it's a reminder, because you're going to see some horrible stuff in this next vision, and this part of it is to remind you you're under God's protection. It's going to be okay. Even if you die, it's going to be okay. Because who cares if we die? Then we get to go to eternity. Right? We're hung up on, well, I don't want to die because we got stuff to do. And we have people we love, even though we'll hopefully see them again someday if they believe. But we're hung up on, I want to preserve my life. Because you don't want to just go out and waste your life. But it is out of your control. It's like, oh. Yeah, anything we can't control. It's like, yeah, if, if, if the, a big rock comes and, and smashes Thompson, okay, so, oh, the, how tragic, oh, yeah, how tragic that all those people went to heaven, right? We don't look at it that way because we're creatures bound in time and space. We have, still can't comprehend what it's going to be like. I mean, we can't even wrap our minds around it kind of temporarily ends when we have the Lord's Supper, let alone what eternity is really going to be like. Uh, so we're kind of a little protective of our mortality. So this is a reminder, despite the horrible things you're going to see, God's got you. He's it's under his control, ultimately. And so it's a reminder, you're under God's divine protection, even during the plagues that we're going to see in this vision. And as uh, Lewis Brighton, who is the author of the Concordia Commentary on Revelation, put it, as the earthly tabernacle embodied God's presence through his covenant with his people in the wilderness, so now the heavenly tabernacle reminds John that God, through the covenant of his Christ, is with his saints on earth with his righteous actions for the protection of his church and for the judgment of her enemies. So this, we get this vision of the heavenly tabernacle. It's like, hey, it's just like in the old days where God's presence was actually in the tent. It's like, now you see, you're, God's got you. Let's see, uh, and out of the temple, verse 6, out of the sanctuary came seven angels with seven plagues. Uh, these angels come straight from the holy presence of God to unleash his righteous judgments upon the earth. They're clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. Where did we see that description before in this book? So gold, golden sash, golden sash around the chest, pure bright linen. Where did we see that? Back in the beginning, maybe? When they saw the one who was standing among the lampstands, right? And his hair was white like wool, and right? Okay, so the it's the same imagery. It's the same, that golden sash, that symbol. Remember we said that, man? Remember what the golden sash means? Sign of royalty. That's what kings were. Right? And crowns. Okay, so the golden slash, this sash, so these angels are wearing this golden sash, which is a sign of royalty, which means they are clothed with the holiness and righteousness of God. Right? So they've got the armor, of, as it were, the armor of God on, right? They are acting on behalf of God. When angels dress up like God, that means they're acting on God's behalf. Right? Just like when um, when knights go out from the king and they carry his standard, right? It's like, oh, that's the flag that hang, flies over the king's castle. They're carrying it because they are acting on behalf of the king, right? When the king sends somebody with his ring, uh, say he sends him with a seal ring to witness a document or something, whoever that servant is that's got the ring, in that moment, he's the king. He is acting on behalf of the king. He has the authority. king's authority. Or in the Roman Empire, when a slave... 
uh, would act on behalf of his master, then you had to accord that slave all the courtesy you were if that guy was standing right there. You didn't treat this guy like a slave. You treated him like whoever his owner was. Uh, and if you didn't, it would not go well for you publicly. And if you actually killed him, because in Rome you could kill your slaves. There was no repercussion. They're slaves. But if you kill the slave of another person, that's like killing that person. So say you killed the governor's slave, that would be like killing the governor. And that would be the penalties because he's acting on behalf of whoever. That's what these angels are doing. So these angels are acting on behalf of God with his authority. Uh, let's see. Right, so the sign of royalty being the golden slash. And in particular, because they're acting on behalf of Christ. So we get the same vision we have of the one that looked like an ancient of days, but it's actually Jesus from chapter one, uh, among the seven lamp, golden lampstands. Okay, so one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels. So these angels don't obtain the bowls of God's wrath uh, from God. They receive them from one of the creatures, holy angels, whatever you want to call them, seraphim, who are, reside around God's throne. We remember we saw that on chapter 4. Uh, so that was the four living creatures, and on one side they had the face of a man, a lion, an ox, an eagle. Right. And they had, with two wings, they flew, two, they covered their faces, two, they covered their feet, right? Okay, so those are seraphim. Um, so these angels are not acting, and this is just to reinforce, these angels don't do this of their own accord. They are doing the bidding of God. And the bidding of God is to dispense his wrath on the earth so that people will repent and turn to him for salvation. And then what does it say? Uh, and the temple was at verse 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. So the sanctuary was filled with smoke throughout scripture. Smoke is an indication of the divine presence and holiness of God. If that's like, and you want to call cloud smoke, fine. Call the glory cloud smoke. Uh, you can see that Exodus 19, Exodus 40, Isaiah 6. Uh, so smoke fills the sanctuary for it's the place of God's divine presence and holiness. So just throughout scripture, smoke is a symbol of God's presence. And then no one could enter the sanctuary. And that's again rem reminiscent of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. When the cloud of God's glory filled it, Moses couldn't enter it as long as the cloud was resting upon it. And then Lewis Brighton commented, so terrifying would be God's holy judgment in the form of the plagues, which John is about to witness, that no one could penetrate these inscrutable righteous actions of God until they were completed at the end itself. In other words, no mortal will uh, fully understand the just actions of God in sending forth his judgments upon the earth until the last day. So until the last day, you're not going to get it. Like we always say, well, I don't get it. Or, That's not fair. Well, yeah, it is. It's fair because God is perfectly righteous and perfectly just. Is, did you take the... I did. Okay. Uh, but you're not going to get it till the last day, and then we're all going to go, oh, yeah, I can see it now. Okay. And by that, then, of course, it won't matter. But, And I think that's going to be true for unbelievers, too. It's like, oh, well, holy crap, there is a God. And, oh, holy crap, he is like God, like judgment. And, oh, yeah, I'm getting what I deserve. I don't... There's not going to be any questions like, I don't deserve this. This isn't fair. I think unbelievers are going to know exactly. Like, well, they did warn me. I mean. It sucks for them. Yeah. And it's just at that point, it'll be too late. But I think there will come the dawning of understanding. And you'll just go, yep, seems fair. <laughs> you think, you think they're going to have time? Like, they're not going to just be, like, scorched by fire? Mm. There's got to be the recognition. They're going to get scorched by fire for eternity. I think they're going to have a moment of unfortunate clarity. I mean, we see it. We see it all over the place. You know, we see it where they try to, they basically try to jump in a hole and pull in the hole after him, like on Bugs Bunny. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they are going to climb into every cave. There's going to be enough going on that people are going to like, yeah, let's run from this. And then they'll find out there's no place to run. 
you know, even though the, all the islands will be ripped out of their places, all the caves of the mountains will come crumbling down. Yeah, I think it would. The sky's going to roll up like a scroll. What's that going to look like? I mean, there, it's not going to be just like over. There's going to be things happening. Sure, they, they they have to be able to reckon with it. You mm -hmm. know, the the fact that they didn't accept it before. No, I mean, he wouldn't make it that easy on you to just be over. You got to suffer somehow, yeah. right? I mean, yes, yeah, so, I mean they're they're gonna they're gonna suffer for all eternity, but they're also going to realize these are the actions of a just and righteous God. Mm -hmm. There'll be no argument. They'll, they'll, they're they're not going to be able to go. Well, oh, but they're just going to go. Seems legit. <laughs> Right, so they're all believer, unbeliever alike. They're all going to know and understand. He alone is God. Every knee shall bow. Uh, but for most, it will be for the unbelievers. It will be too late. But for the faithful, that's the day. It's like that's the day we're looking forward to. It's going to be the great and terrible day of the Lord, as it is called. It's going to be great, and it's going to be terrible. But you're going to look at it, and you're never going to go, that's not fair. You're going to go, oh, that makes perfect sense. That is righteous. You'll actually understand what the word righteous means. We use that word, but we don't really know what it means. We can't really describe what it means, because it only describes one thing, and that's God. Yeah. What do you uh, tell somebody, not to get too far off, but that's someone right. who thinks that they're, they're religious... That they're Christian, but they they don't think that they sin. They're following all the rules. How do, how do you get through to them that their their thinking is wrong? Yeah, I mean they need to actually read the Bible. And and when I ask them to do that, they say, "Well, I don't read. I won't read." It's like, "Well, you're ignorant, and you're going to remain ignorant." I mean, this is my father, and I, I want mean, to get through to him. The only way you can get through to him is Hebrews one one. You know, in, in many and various ways, God spoke through the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. So it's like he, the only way God communicates to us today is through the words of Christ, period. You know, there's not going out and communing on a hilltop with nature, which, hey, if that relaxes you, great. But if you think you're going to be in communion with God, and everything's going to be all right with the world because you did that? No, it's not, because God's not there. I mean, he's there, but he's not there. It's not how he communicates with us. Right. You know, you're not going to feel this feeling of serenity and go, oh, well, God has made me calm. No, I mean, yes, God can do that, but that's not how God communicates. You're not going to, you're not going to, just, like, you, you're not going to have a relationship with God if there's no communication going on. That's the way communication important. the way communication goes on is we pray and then God answers prayers. Well, how does God answer prayers? Well, you can see it in your lives. God answers prayers through the people he puts in your life. It's like, well, how can you say that God provides me everything for my bodily needs? You know, I go to the grocery, I work, I go to the grocery store and I pay money for food. Yes, and through the work of those farmers that harvested the food and the people that drove the truck to the store and the person who pays you a wage for doing a job so they could afford to go to that store and buy food. God provided you food through the people in your life. That's how this works. I mean, it sounds kind of dumb when you put it that way, but that's actually how it works. God created man to be communal and live in a society, not on a mystical mountaintop by himself like a monk. Mount Athos. Yeah, yeah Mount Athos. I just still want to visit there someday because it looks kind of neat. Uh, and don't forget. And then God doesn't, what God doesn't do is go, this is what I think you should do tomorrow. If you're hearing voices in your head telling you that you think are God telling you things, you should not listen to them because one, you may need therapy. You, you may, may have mental illness. Or two, it's not God. And if it's not God and it's an actual voice in your head, guess what it is? It's a demon. Don't listen to demons. Don't talk to snakes. Don't listen to demons. Simple. And I'm, I'm kind of flippant about it, but it's the truth. God doesn't talk to us by talking to us anymore. That ended right. in the old covenantal system. God doesn't talk to people like that anymore. And you can see the transition. He talked to certain people. He didn't talk to everybody. And when he did talk to everybody, everybody said, please don't do that again. 
pick a guy, have him tell us what you said because it's too horrifying to listen to you speak. Plus, God deals with everybody differently, right? I mean, can't, everybody needs a different approach. Yep. In order to get but there. he only talks to us one way now, and that's this. This is how God communicates to you. Yeah. Okay, so that's how he talks to us. Yeah. So if you're not going to read that, then you are not going to have a relationship with God. It's going to be one-way conversation. You're going to pray and you're not going to hear anything. Because that's where he answers us. And he even gives us in there the words to give to him when we don't know how to right, pray. Right. It's like, well, how do you pray? Say this. And there's 150 other prayers in here for every occasion. They're called Psalms. That's what they're for. So, so how to get through to somebody that, you know, I don't need church they, they, they or I don't need. not a sinner. I yeah, don't if you're sin. not a sinner, God's word tells you otherwise. And if you don't want to listen to God's word and you don't believe you're a sinner, well, then what do you need Jesus for? If you're not a sinner, you don't need Jesus. And if you're not a sinner, well, you're good. You're good. If you, if you do, never do wrong. Have you ever, 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 never done anything wrong? Really? How can anybody say that? What's what's even harder is as I'm looking at him, listening to him talking, the pictures of Christ on the wall behind him and everything, mm -hmm. and every other word is an f bomb and this and that, and it's just like you're so out of control, and you're you're posting this up like this is what you believe. It surrounds you, but you're not well, living that way. Yeah, at ask all. him why did God send His Son into our flesh to become? The God Man, Jesus to Christ, feel, to 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 feel the uh, why do I want to say why did God become human to go through the suffering that we do? Okay, why? Well, that's true. To take the uh, to take the punishment for for our sins, because so, there's no more sacrifice. He said, right, he was the ones for all, also one book, also book of right, Hebrews. Right. You get a lot out of, everybody gets a lot of book of Hebrews, but the once for all, all men, the once for all sacrifice. Right. So, please, what? I, this, I mean, everything you're saying is, of course, 100% perfect, but I think you're forgetting one thing. Mm. I mean, it's great to have these conversations with people and, you know, try to get them to understand, but ultimately, but, don't forget the power of prayer and praying yeah. that the Holy Spirit starts to work in their heart. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. not, absolutely. we can't save somebody. Right. It's not right. our job. Right. Yeah, right. All, you, all you can do uh, is... I do pray. Daddy yeah. does. I want him to be happy, and he's not. But, I mean, that, yeah, it's, you know, ask him, why did, why did Jesus come? Yeah. And if, and what's his answer? And if, it's not to take away the sins of the world because you don't, well, you came to take away everybody else's sins but yours, apparently. Really? I mean, that's irrational. If he's very irrational, but uh, I don't want to get But it. yeah, just keep chipping away at that. I do. Yeah. That's right. And, 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 you know, and then, God willing, the spirit breaks through one day and he's going to go, oh, I get it. Yeah, <laughs> or he's just going to go. I'm afraid he's going to be one of those oh. too late people and when he gets it and he's going to. But, uh, you never know. I mean, you just like fight hard to yeah. resist it, even though in his heart he knows it's true. But you just want to. And we don't know because we can't see into people's hearts. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I think those people, they're in denial, but they understand they know they're a sinner. And they just don't want to admit it. Yeah. So. And that, that, that's. You nailed that could it be. there. That could you be. nail it there. You know, it's like he tells himself something enough times that he actually believes it. Yeah. You know, that's uh, usually I how that works.